Welcome to. I don't need it. Hello. So we are going to start in about. Uh, we're going to start about two minutes to allow some more students to sign in, grab their seats, and then we'll get the presentation started. Thank you for coming to Democracy Days. Now it's a minute and a half. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Democracy Day, event number three. On day number three, we're talking about why unions are still important, which is a very on-time topic. Um, everyone's heard what's going on with the UAW. Uh, we have uh, issues with nurses as well as uh, talking about striking. So uh, we have a great presentation today from Rebecca Ilaseri and Professor Deborah Crank-Lewis. I'm going to step off, let them speak for themselves, and thank you for coming out. There will be a Q&A, so save your questions, spit them out, and we'll take care of you. Thank you for coming to Democracy Days. Good afternoon. Um, like Mar uh, Marvin said, I'm Rebecca Clemmy Elisari, catalog librarian at SCC and SCC staff union president. And with me today is Professor Deborah Crank Lewis, history professor at SCC and an SCC faculty union member. So today we're going to talk about why unions are still important from a few different perspectives. We'll start with Deb giving some context and history of unions starting in medieval times. Then we'll go into more current union situations and we'll talk about our own experiences in unions. Good afternoon. Thank you for your kind introduction. And so glad that you are here. So um, just so that you know, I really did rein in my proclivity for backstory, so I'm not going to torment you with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of slides, just several dozen. So this is giving you a look at um, the kind of the origins of labor unions. And that became the organization of medieval guilds. And they took many, many different forms, and they were usually focused on some type of craft or product. The, one of the oldest was the Stonecutters Union, our Stonecutters Guild, and obviously cathedrals had a tremendous amount of demand to produce cut stone that could be used in the construction. But that's not limited to that. There are potters, there are bakers. Some of these skills obviously go back into prehistoric times. Goldsmith was one of the most uh, rigorous components. The glaciers made the stained glass windows for the cathedrals. The chandlers made candles. So anything that you can imagine was governed by a guild. 
the hours that workers had to spend or could spend, the amount of money that you had to pay your employees, what you could charge for a product, how long it took to become a master craftsperson, becoming an apprentice, a journeyman, and then finally passing whatever exam to become a, a master craftsman to produce your masterpiece, indicating that you had achieved the appropriate skill and then you could offer your craft to the public. There were very strict rules about how you could sell your product, when you could sell your product. Sometimes in some communities, if you coughed on market day, you'd be fined because you were trying to draw attention to your product and get people to buy it. So they could be pretty uh, strict about things. Weaponry, of course, chain mail, swords, arrows, the Fletcher produced arrows, blacksmiths, harriers, all kinds of crafts would have been included. <clears throat> As we move into the Renaissance time period, even people that we think of with such great artistic gifts would also form guilds and take control of how their paintings were displayed, what could be produced, how it was sold, and their level of capacity as an artist. As we move into the Industrial Revolution, we start to see people in cottage industries who are doing various parts of tasks and they're being paid, but there isn't very much in terms of regulation as we'd seen during the Craft Guild days. This is giving you a look at kind of the next step as we watch the piecework or the task work of individual cottage laborers morphing into the factory. And that's what you see here in Max Lieberman's paint, The Flax Barn at Lorraine. These children are sitting there hour after hour after hour turning the spinning wheel in order to produce a bobbin full of linen thread so that it can be woven into linen fabric. The Industrial Revolution usually comes in a couple of phases. That kind of depends on the source that you look at. But usually we have the first part where we move from the use of uh, cast iron and wrought iron to the second part where we see steel production take over as the metal of choice. Having iron ore deposits, having coal deposits, those are the, that's the oil of the time period. Those are the resources that people would tend to fight over. But what nobody thought about, even though we'd left the Middle Ages behind, you know, several hundred years before we start to talk about the, the uh, Industrial Revolution, we didn't think about the human factor. People were literally almost plugged into these machines and nobody thought about the fact that they're doing these repetitive tasks, they're doing them for 12 or 14 hours a day and no consideration is given for any kind of safety factor. And when you look at this image, you're looking at a textile mill and you can see that there are women and children. They were cheaper labor. You could pay them less than you could pay adult men. Um, You'll notice, too, that there is no shielding on any of these appliances. All of these, you know, textile processes were very loud and very dangerous. Fabric produces lint. The lint is constantly coming off of these machines and settling into your lungs. It's also settling on the mechanisms of the machine, so they'd have to turn them off periodically and clean them and re-oil them. Only children were small enough to go inside these machines. But here's the tricky part of the process. You have to take the child out before you turn the machine back on. That didn't always happen. So people are literally ground up in these things. Do you think these women and children weren't raped? They were, and there wasn't anything they could do about it if they wanted to keep those jobs, if they wanted the, the small amount of money that they might be paid. This little boy, Giles Newsom, 12 years old, became the poster child, if you will, for the effort to make child labor laws a reality. All kinds of state legislatures would introduce child labor laws. But every time it came up for a vote, it seems, that businesses would immediately write to legislators and say, if you want my campaign contributions, you better vote against this. And so it was very difficult. Many states began to adopt mandatory school attendance as a way to create, a way to take children out of the workplace. 
course, Parliament in England gives us a perfect example. They passed a law that said you had to be at least 10 years old to work in a coal mine. So obviously that addressed the problem uh, quite handily. This little boy, Giles, was carrying a box. It was too big and he couldn't manage the weight. He lost his balance, the box fell on his foot and when he reached out to balance himself, his hand went straight into the gears of the machine and these two fingers were ripped out of his hand. So you can see why he was a sympathetic feature to put in the campaign against child labor. But it's gonna be a while before we see that go away. <clears throat> this is a illustration of the Homestead Steel Strike where workers are demanding an eight hour workday. So I realize that not everybody gets the luxury of an eight hour workday. Oftentimes I don't get that because I do work beyond that eight hour workday, but that's a choice that I get to make. Not everybody gets that. But the fight to create labor unions to protect people from dangerous workplaces, from machines that would be detrimental to their health, to working hours that were completely unreasonable, 12, 14 hours a day, and low wages and abuse, quite honestly, in the workplace, it's not a surprise that people began to turn to some type of organization that would help them push back against that kind of uh, abuse. This is a photograph of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory in New York. And a lot of women were employed in this factory, not exclusively, but a lot of women. Garment factories were also dangerous. Lint was a continuous problem. Not only does it collect in your lungs, it's also very, very flammable. Many of these women were Eastern European immigrants, mothers, daughters, aunts, cousins. Many of them were related to one another and lived in nearby communities in New York City. The people that owned the factory became concerned that women might misuse uh, the fire escapes as an opportunity to take a break from their work. So they locked the fire escape doors. That turned into the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. And it was a horrifying event. Uh, there were several women in a house not too far away, just a few blocks away from this event. And they were set, getting ready to have a little visit and have tea, and one of the friends that had been invited came through the door breathless. She said, oh my gosh, you can't believe it, there's a fire at the factory down the street. So they all got up and they ran down the street to see what was happening. And one woman talked about the fact that as she looked at this building being engulfed in flames, she saw these brightly colored fabrics coming out the window. And she thought at first, what was happening is that they were throwing bolts of fabric out to save them from the fire. But then she realized that's not at all what she was seeing. There was a young man standing by an open window and window sills in factory buildings at that point were high up and the windows were quite large or could be. He was lifting these women up to the ledge. Their foot would just touch down on the ledge and then he would drop them into the street below. And almost all of them died from their injuries. And this woman who's observing this and recounting the story later said she watched and this young woman, when her foot touched down on the step on the ledge, she reached up and kissed this young man on his cheek and he dropped her to her death. Her name was Frances Perkins. She became the first female Secretary of Labor under Franklin Roosevelt's administration, and she spent her entire life dedicated to making sure people were never treated that way again. Franklin Roosevelt said, if I went to work in a factory, the first thing I would do is join a union. Needless to say, he was a friend to organized labor, which had not always been the case. He also advocated a second Bill of Rights, that every American has the right to a job, an adequate wage, and decent living, a decent home, medical care, economic protection during sickness, accident, old age, or unemployment, and a good education. Some of the benefits that we enjoy, like safety in the workplace, happened because labor unions pushed for those things, and they were finally recognized. 
Missouri, at one point, uh, has had the battle of right to work uh, be pressed upon it. And in 2018, that changed. The Missouri General Assembly and the governor at the time, Governor Crichton, signed into law right to work status. And it was the workers of this state that pushed back against that. And they got enough signatures on enough petitions. They put that issue on the ballot, and the good people of Missouri voted it down. So they spared Missouri from that fate of right to work. Because right to work is not something that benefits people except the ones that don't want you to be in a union. It benefits them because they can pay you lower wages, and they don't have to pay as much attention to safety issues. So this gives you a way of comparing that. $28 as opposed to $24 for an average hourly wage. Worker health insurance, 92% of the people in states that have collective bargaining or don't have right to work, as opposed to 87%. So your insurance, your capacity to be insured drops, your wages drop, your life expectancy drops. And that's something that we sometimes don't think about. The 10 poorest states in the union and I'm giving you the numbers in terms of the bottom. These are the states that are right to work. Okay. It's not all of them, certainly. And then lastly, just to leave you with this, uh, there are still companies that are making an effort to stop the formation of unions. Obviously, they don't want a union in their workplace. I had a good friend, he said, you know what? Companies get the union they deserve. So when unionization comes, it's because there's a problem that's not being addressed. And the workers have the capacity to change that. And we sh should never forget that. Thank you. Thank you, Deb, for that um, history. That was great. And so um, now we're going to um, look um, at uh, one of the SCC situations. And um, the SCC um, adjunct faculty union representative um, provided us with a statement um, on are unions still relevant? And so I'm going to read that now. I am Michael Murphy, and I'm a union representative, internal organizer for SEIU Local One. Our local represents the adjunct professors here at St. Charles Community College. We also represent adjunct professors at St. Louis Community College, Washington University, and St. Louis University in the St. Louis metropolitan area. The union was asked to provide a statement on behalf of the adjunct professors. Ideas of an adjunct union started to form in 2014, ending with a final vote in favor of unionizing with SEIU Local 1 in 2016. The initial adjunct contract was up for renegotiation, which started in 2021. Over the course of a year and a half, the adjunct committee met over Zoom calls with the SCC negotiation committee to form a new contract. Our current contract is effective August 1st, 2022 to July 31st, 2024. There are many things that our adjuncts would like to express about their situation, but unfortunately, there's too much fear of retaliation from speaking out. So that's their statement, and then his letter goes on. As stated, the adjuncts as well as other workers have fears around repercussions and retaliation for standing up for the union. While workers have a legal right to join and participate in their union, oftentimes employers will tread on these rights because the, the, the penalties are not severe. And if they succeed in chilling union support, then it becomes worth it to them to push right up to, or often well past the boundaries of the law. Unions are absolutely still relevant. Unions exist to better the terms and conditions for workers at their work locations. In the ongoing push to prioritize profit over all else, the income gap has grown at staggering proportions, and workers who do not have union representation often struggle to pay for housing and basic needs even if they work multiple jobs. Unions give workers a chance to negotiate with their employers as equals and push for a living wage, good benefits, and retirement plans. Unions are also leaders in the fight for social and economic justice. Many unions lead the fight against forms of inequality, which includes racial and gender inequalities as well as LGBTQ protections. 
workers continue to fight to make changes in an effort to improve their work and home lives and to get better wages to support them and their family. However, the adjunct faculty at SCC do not have access to health care or any benefits such as retirement. Evidence abounds in the current strikes by the UAW where workers are taking a stand for pay equity and the writers and actors unions where they are fighting for their livelihood. The studios proposed that they would own the permanent rights to extras images if they were on set for even one day. And without the Screen Actors Guild, there would be no opportunity to fight back. We have a 40 hour work week thanks to the labor movement and unions continue to be as vital as ever. So that is um, the adjunct faculty union statement from um, Michael Murphy, um, their union representative. And then um, now we can um, move on to um, union busting um, in more modern times. And um, again, um, as, as Deb was saying, this um, image is um, representative of a current situation in um, unionization and union busting, Starbucks. So um, Starbucks has been in the news a lot recently, and I feel like they offer a good case study of modern union organizing. And as of yesterday when I checked, 355 Starbucks stores out of around 16,000 stores in the United States have voted to unionize. This is a significant success in labor organizing. However, it too hasn't been without hiccups. The National Labor Relations Board has brought 100 cases against Starbucks, alleging more than 1,000 illegal actions related to retaliation against workers for unionizing, closing stores for unionizing, and reducing workers' hours after their stores unionized. The NLRB also filed a complaint accusing Starbucks of simply refusing to bargain at 163 unionized stores across 28 states. However, sometimes the NLRB is unable to offer accountability to companies for breaking labor law, including being unable to fine them for illegally firing workers, leading union drives, or closing stores or operations in retaliation for its workers unionizing. It can rule that a company has broken the law by not bargaining with employees, but it can't order the company to reach a first contract. And so even though so many Star um, Starbucks stores have unionized, as of late August, Starbucks still hadn't reached a contract with any of the unionized stores. This refusal to bargain sends a message to employees that there's no guarantee that stores will be able to negotiate a first contract soon to improve wages and benefits. The cumulative effect of these actions can end up scaring workers who would unionize, but despite Starbucks' aggressive tactics, many workers remain optimistic they're doing everything they can to crush our, un our organizing effort. What they're doing is terrible, closing stores and firing, said Casey Moore, a union spokesperson and fired Buffalo barista. But every day, we still have stores filing for elections and workers emerging with new energy. And so um, that's the, the story of Starbucks currently in their unionizing efforts. It's not easy, but worthwhile. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about my own union experience. I had never been part of a union before, but I had always wanted to make sure that people are treated well at work. As a librarian, I want to do all that I can to help people explore and engage their curiosity and community. And as an ordained minister and human being, I want for everyone to have real means and opportunity to be who they want to be, who they're called to be in the world, and to support the institutions and organizations who are doing the work to make that a greater reality. And having worked as staff in higher ed for over a decade, we regularly hear about the importance of students and faculty, not always so much about staff. I get it. There's no college without our students, obviously, and the students aren't taught without faculty. I would also add, though, that faculty can't teach students without staff doing the work we do which is to keep infrastructure not only operational, but also vibrant and hospitable. And so all that is to say, we all need each other. The truth is that everyone on a college campus is important, and in order for people to feel like they're really a part of things and count, staff need to have input on things that, that matter to them and their jobs. We all care about students, and we wouldn't be working in higher ed if we didn't. And so with all this in mind, um, staff can better do what we're here to do when we're empowered to make decisions in community about what we need to best serve students. 
So with these things in mind, and having learned about how power works through my work and training at Metropolitan Congregations United, I've had an interest in unions for a, a long time. I started working at SCC in um, 2015, in the fall of 2015. But the interesting thing about my own union membership is that I didn't know that we even had a staff union until the fall of 2021. I learned that we had this union from another SCC employee who had investigated the possibility of forming a staff union because they too didn't realize that we had one. We learned that the SCC staff union has, according to our certificate of representation, been legally certified by the Missouri State Board of Mediation since 1994. However, um, the, the last um, staff union contract that I have seen was dated um, in 20, uh, 2011, 2011. And so um, from that period of um, about a decade, 2011 or so to 2021, um, there was this period of dormancy in the union. And what led to that period of dormancy? And I have found it challenging to find out what was going on then because um, many people have left SCC and many of the people still here um, are pretty quiet about um, what may have happened. And so, so it's been interesting. Um, some people might feel, um, they might fear job loss or other forms of re retaliation. But um, I've discovered in my experience that unions can help build community. When I came to work at SCC back in the fall of 2015, I was excited to work on a college campus and to really be a part of this campus community. I found it challenging, though, at the time to um, leave my desk, you know, get away from work, and also to meet people in other departments. And then in a few years, COVID hit, and so our work landscape pivoted really quickly to working from home, um, and that helped most of us with a greater work-life balance, but it made it um, challenging to connect with other people. And so, as a union member and then president of the SCC Staff Union, I've had many more opportunities to talk with people. And just um, getting out and talking to people can help us build a culture of authentic hospitality that is genuinely welcoming on this campus. And so that's one benefit of unions that I have experienced. And then um, I've also found in line with that that um, unions, they can also offer a sense that we're really all in this together. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. This is the interrelated structure of reality. Unions invite us to consider not only how we show up as employees, but also how we show up as people in community and how we live out the values of equity and justice, not just as mere philosophical ideas, but as actual lived reality. And so, that's what I have to say, and let the discussion begin. I stopped with the historical part of this, but there is one more thing to take a look at. We already went through that. Is that I, too, am a member of a union, a very, very proud member of a union. And the AFL-CIO has many union organizations within it. And the NFL Players is one of them. And so is the American Federation of Teachers. And I am a member of Local 4803 and could not be prouder of that fact. When I started, thank you. When I started um, 35 years ago, there was no adjunct union. I'm glad there's one now. And as soon as I became a full-time person, as Mr. Roosevelt said, the very first thing I did was join a union. And it has been a very personally rewarding experience, and professionally it has given me a tremendous sense of security. I have come to know a wider number of my faculty members, and I know that we're all pulling for each other in a very positive way to impact the academic world that benefits all of you. So you are the recipients of that wonderful group of people who works together to do the thing that we love every day, and that is to offer you the opportunity for an education. So again, I thank you for being here, and thank you for being supportive of this. Uh, 
I like to uh, management to do the right thing. Now, I'm not saying all management is bad. I'm no, I don't mean that at all. There's lots of good employers out there, but there are a lot of them who are perfectly happy to skirt the law when it suits their purpose because it helps them save money or it helps them have more control over how work is accomplished. So yes, it's better today, but it's not perfect. Um, so what, I'm in the same class as her and about the farm workers of America, majority of them are illegal immigrants who came here to get a better life. What about them? Can they join a union? I'm not f familiar enough with labor law to answer that question adequately. There might be somebody else that can answer that question, mm -hmm. but people, undocumented workers often are excluded from a gigantic amount of almost anything that could protect them or offer them something better whether it's social services or access to a union, and sometimes that will bring people into a spotlight that they don't want to be in because they don't want to be deported. And so they put up with deplorable conditions as a result of that. Thank those questions. There's always time for more. Here I come. So what would be examples of union busting tactics that um, management or even higher up would use uh, at uh, companies where they're noticing um, either um, organized labor talk or even ones that exist, unions that exist that they would like to not support? Well, um, like in the the Starbucks um, stores, um, they would um, they've closed stores that um, have had um, that have voted to unionize. Um, they have cut people's hours. Um, what else was I reading? Um, they have, um, in some cases, have offered raises to non-unionized stores, and um, so uh, they get more. Um, more material rewards from the uh, the company, um, but um, but they're not unionized. So um, it's it seems like it's more subtle these days than than it used to be uh, because you had some um, pretty blatant examples. Um, do you have? Well, of course, in the past it was pretty obvious. I mean, they're going to shoot people in the street, and private armies were not an unusual thing. Henry Frick was the person that Andrew Carnegie used to get rid of the problem of the Homestead steel workers. So he's happy to build a library so you could read a book, but he wasn't going to give you a decent living wage. So as Harry Truman said, the Homestead steel workers' blood dripped off the Carnegie libraries. It's not that obvious in more modern times, except that when companies can still employ local police forces to sometimes be the strong arm, and that does happen occasionally. I'm sorry that it does. I'm glad, too, that law enforcement officers and firefighters have unions and that it helps protect them and, you know, protects them in terms of their working conditions and protects them in terms of their wages. But it is more subtle. A union might be forbidden to meet on company property, and that's sometimes difficult then to get people together in a different spot. It takes any number of forms, and oftentimes it's, it's very, you know, not, uh, not observable, but just little things, and they just keep at you. And, and I would also add that um, cultures of, of fear and intimidation um, go a long way toward discouraging unions, um, because if, um, if you feel like, um, like you can't talk about a union, then um, obviously it makes it um, challenging to, um, to organize it and keep it going, and so, um, I think that um, that is that's probably more um, prevalent than the um, a lot of the strong arm tactics um, from yesteryear. Oh, there's a question up here. 
and then back over here. Hi, I'm Alexa. Um, as there are quite a few of us here in the culinary arts department of SCC, are there any notable culinary unions as students that are looking into going into the field that we should be aware of? There's a union for confectionery and I, I'm not going to get the name right because I don't know the whole entire name of it, but confectionery workers and restaurant workers, there's, there are service unions for groups like that, uh, which people should join because there are safety issues in kitchens. There's underage difficulties in kitchens quite often. And there's also uh, undocumented people who are at risk in a lot of the restaurant industry. So uh, yes, absolutely, that should be investigated and when you have the opportunity, do it because you're safer. Hi there, we're also in the culinary. Um, how do you feel about businesses setting up a pension plan for their workers? Well, it's a nice idea. More of them should do it, but, but they should also not be robbing those pension plans of their employees, which they frequently are. So I think that's a, a difficulty um, in terms of what people face sometimes in private industry because 401ks can turn into a thing that don't leave you with very much at the end of the day. Oh, another question. Um, okay, so I know that like unions are supposed to be better, but could there also still be like, I don't know, like holes in the union, like still like labor laws still being like, not followed in all that in unions? I don't know if you understand. <laughs> okay, maybe you can help me with that. Okay, so like, so could labor laws in unions still be like not followed? Are, are they perfect? Are those labor laws yes. in the unions that are, are you know, essentially demanding that those laws be upheld? Of course, there are going, laws are only as good as the people who enforce them. So, you know, there's all kinds of safety standards in the workplace. OSHA's responsibility is to maintain safety in the workplace. I had a good friend, she worked for a manufacturing firm. They manufactured parts. A worker was injured. They came into her office. She's the secretary. This person's got blood coming out of them, like spurting. They gave them a towel, hold it tight, don't go to the doctor, because that'll change our safety record. Okay, those things happen, and they're terrible things, and they shouldn't happen, and that company should be fine for that kind of behavior. But I'm sorry to say those things still go on. So the law is only as good as the people who are willing to obey it and the people who are there to enforce it. And I also have to say that when I was reading about the, the Starbucks um, situation, it was um, really interesting to learn that the, the National Labor Relations Board um, often doesn't have as, as much teeth as we would, um, we might want it to. Um, and so um, I would, um, yeah, agree with what, what Deb is saying, that um, um, it's, it's as strong as its enforcement and um, as, as strong as the, the people who are working to enforce it, so. Hi, Nicole Schumann. These are my students. Um, all the culinary students are my students and Chef Mike's students. I think it might be helpful if you could clarify the benefits of collective bargaining and that the primary reason that we joined the union would be for collective bargaining purposes as opposed to individual bargaining and also kind of the uniting of workers to help hold outside of the law, help hold those employers accountable. I think that might be helpful for them. Not every state has collective bargaining. Uh, that's problematic. We came close in the state of Missouri, my understanding is we came close uh, to having that voted in and it missed by just a little bit. So collective bargaining, you know, that's not available to everybody. Sometimes it's available to some parts of the, of the working population, but not all. Now the, the UAW will eventually, I assume, hopefully, get the company to go into some kind of a bargaining agreement uh, because they gave up a lot and to save the company, the company made giant profits that they weren't willing to share. 
So collective bargaining can be very effective, but not every union, especially in terms of, of public entities like police and firefighters and teachers for that matter, have access to that kind of protection. Well, and could you explain that? Because I, I think that um, there, there might be the perception that once you join a union that, that you have access to collective bargaining. That, um, and so you, you would probably be able to um, make that more clear than, than I could. I like your confidence. <laughs> um, as I said, not every public employees often do not have collective bargaining afforded to them. But the working parts of the population that are not under the heading of public employees do have collective bargaining. They can enter into arrangements and they can, you know, in, this, in terms of teachers going on strike, there have been teacher strikes in St. Louis in the past. Before they accept the contract, when the contract expires, they've got that moment that they can go on strike but that can wind up being a difficult spot for a lot of people. It could be that way for anybody who doesn't have the protection of collective bargaining. So employees in a restaurant or in any kind of service area would have that capacity in a union because they're not, they don't fall under the same heading as, as public employees. I'm probably not doing a very good job explaining this, but I'm, this is what you got right here. So. So back to what you were saying about the collective bargaining, right? I, I'm not even going to lie. I had to Google what that meant. But so it's negotiating like your salary, how much you get paid per your hour. Your working conditions, your salary, any number of things can go into a collective bargaining agreement. So it would be the union sitting down with management and saying, here are, here are the demands of our membership. Here are the things that we feel are important. Here are the things we need. And then there's a, a certain degree of back and forth until finally a contract is agreed upon that the membership then has to vote on. So collective bargaining is problematic too because like if you're negotiating how much you're supposed to be getting paid, like on the news they're talking about like uh, GMC, people that work for car companies that are building seats and car parts and all that, like they're not getting the wages that they typically deserve because they're putting in more labor on their back. Kind of related to um, the crop farm workers, how they're doing a lot of, it's one of the most dangerous jobs in the US. So when it comes to collective bargaining, like, I don't know, I don't feel like everybody really has much of a say so when it comes to it. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last part of what you said. I don't think that everyone has a say-so when it comes to collective bargaining, depending well, on where they work. Because if there was something that could prevent collective bargaining where you don't have to negotiate and everything could be fair, then that would probably make things better. People won't, won't be going on strike and stuff like that. I think it would make things better. I think it would make things a lot better if we didn't have to do it. The problem is we have to do it because the management won't say yes to it. It's like, no, we're going to do as little as possible. We're going to spend as little as possible. We don't want to cut into our profit margin. And essentially, you've got the people who do the work saying, well, you're going to have to rethink that. Because here we are as representatives of our membership, and here are the things that they expect. Here are the things they want. So I have a question regarding nursing unions. I don't know if y'all know much on that, but St. Louis University Hospital is about to start a strike. I think it's next week. And I've seen in the past that hospitals will lock out nurses after a strike has ended. Does the union still continue to compensate nurses that are locked out? Or does the strike pay end when union, I mean, when the strike ends? Okay, that I cannot answer. I'm not familiar with how it works with a nurses union. I didn't know if you yeah, knew anything sorry. about that. I don't know. Um, so with franchises like Starbucks, when they're demanding more from the actual franchise itself, does that mean the managers and GMs can join in on the strike too? Um, 
I am, I'm not sure about that. Um, with, fr with franchises like Starbucks, um, when they're demanding more from the actual franchise itself, can the managers and GMs join? Um. Yeah. They're, they're not considered staff in the same way that the workers are. Hey, I just wanted to go back to the comment about not everyone having a say so. Usually before negotiations, uh, a union will put out a survey to their membership to get a feel of what they want to discuss during negotiations, in addition to salary, because usually salary is one of those things. Usually a president will pick a bargaining team. They will go in, okay? But every member does get a say. They get a say at the beginning. Now, all those suggestions may not make it, Okay, but at the end, you have a ratification meeting, and that's where all your questions, all the proposals are there, all your questions can be answered, and you get to vote whether you want to ratify it or not. So that's kind of that uh, give and take there, or, or balance of everyone does get a voice in that. Okay. Um, so how does a union start and how do you find a union? Well, um, there are a few different ways of, of doing that. Um, first is um, having the, the will to organize, saying um, I want to, um, I, I think that we need a union. Um, and so then um, you can go to, um, I would say your, your occupational um, area and uh, look up and, um, you know, I would do, th there's probably a better way of doing this. I'm a librarian, I should know this, um, but um, I would start with a, an internet search, um, finding um, out if there is um, a discipline specific national organization and then, um, and also, like um, what what we did um, in the SCC staff union, we we discovered when um, there was interest in organizing one that that we already had one. So it, it might bear um, making sure that that you don't have one already. Um, but if you don't have one, go to your national org, and usually um, they have directions in terms of what you can do to um, get um, a union going and who to talk to. Um, there um, are, um, they'll put you in contact with, with people either on national staff or in your area. And then, um, then you'll talk to people, um, um, your, your coworkers and such, and uh, see if they're interested in that. Um, off of work time, usually, um, and, and sometimes um, out of, um, out of your place of employment because um, those are, um, you, you need to watch that, but um, th those are some good basic first steps. Do you have anything to add, Deb? There is a culinary workers union, so you might take a look at their website and see what they have to offer. I got a quick, oh. I feel like it's, it's on. Well, that's my bad. <laughs> I got a quick question about um, stigmatisms. I think that's the right word for this. Um, like, why aren't more workers going on strike, fighting for a union? Is it like just fear? Um, not, um, well, people can't strike in, in every state. Is that um, Missouri doesn't, we, we public employees cannot, cannot strike. Or not very effective. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, um, so there, there's sometimes legislation that, um, that prohibits this depending on um, geography. And, um, and then, I mean, there, there is a lot of, um, a lot of fear um, around um, striking and taking action. And that's, um, well, that's one of the whole points of unions is that it is less scary to um, do things like um, bargain for salary and working conditions and, and strike if that is possible if you're not doing it by yourself um, strength in numbers but um, but fear is strong 
There are subtle things that get done in terms of work stoppages, work slowdowns, uh, people calling in sick. I mean, they do different things. Even, even groups that have <clears throat> a law working against them in terms of striking can do things to make their point. So for, um, he was talking about some legislation um, prohibits certain groups um, from striking. Why doesn't more governments, either state or governmental, um, help the workers in having more fair across the states? And because for the Bill of Rights, it said that you have good wage housing um, living conditions and all that, but some of the wages and some of the uh, work um, conditions are not suitable for everyone. And why doesn't more, why doesn't it get more focused on and it just comes in waves of just like, um, like every now and then everyone starts complaining about minimum wage and then it goes down, goes down a little bit, then the companies roll back on some things and it comes, it's just like a pendulum and swings back and forth. There's a whole host of reasons for those things. One part of it is it costs money and companies don't like to have their profit margin affected by anything in terms of minimum wage or worker safety or any of that stuff. They don't want to deal with that. They don't want to think about spending money on that kind of stuff. They don't like regulations. They don't like often, not all companies, but oftentimes they don't like regulations because there's the bottom line. They don't want to, anything to infringe on their profit margin. Sometimes workers forget their power. Nothing happens without the working class, nothing. We wouldn't be sitting here. The lights wouldn't be on. The floor wouldn't be clean. We couldn't function in this space. I couldn't do my job. You couldn't do your job without the working class population. Everything, food, manufacturing, transportation, commerce, all of it is totally dependent on the working class. There's where their power lies. And if they don't push back against those infractions and that mistreatment, then it just keeps happening. So that's, those are some aspects of why it doesn't happen. And then you have those knee-jerk reactions. Oh, look, that factory burned down. Well, we ought to look at, into that. But why does it take that? Why wasn't the factory safe to start with? Because that costs money. So. Um, for the government side, why don't they more enforce it? Like they have the CDC for the health of the public, for like the general public, but why not for the workforce? Well, there, there is OSHA, which is designed to protect workers. Well, if you don't know about a violation, how do you address a violation? If a worker feels like they're gonna be fired for going to the doctor, then perhaps they'll decide not to go to the doctor and then they don't know about the violation and they cannot hold the company accountable. That's just one example. Well, and then also, as we um, saw with the, the Starbucks case, um, the National Labor Relations Board, um, they have, the, there is some legislation that helps, but it um, ends up being a bit toothless in um, some settings because they, they can't, um, they can't always find businesses for things. Um, you know, a, a lot of this seems like it's about economics and, and so um, if, if it's possible to um, leverage economic consequences um, against um, businesses that don't follow rules, um, it might be easier to um, enforce some labor laws. But, um, but then I, I would also imagine like, that changing those laws um, gets into the congressional gridlock that, that we have. And, um, and so it's, it's challenging to um, to get better labor laws when, when it's hard to really get um, any laws passed, so. Okay, so I just wanted to ask, um, what about companies that, like Walmart, that make it impossible for 
uh, to be unionized, like how could or should employees unionize when there's even just a whisper of union when there's like a, such a big threat to their job? They take a terrible risk, but that is a risk that somebody has to feel is worth taking. But there's another aspect to the point you make about it's difficult for people at Walmart to make, a, to make unionization happen. People shop at Walmart. Lots and lots of people shop at Walmart, and Walmart makes a huge amount of money off of those shoppers. And they also make a tremendous amount of money in terms of tax dollars. And their employees are subsidized by all of us. We have the power of the pocketbook to make our point. Now, whether we choose to do that or not is another matter altogether. But it, it does, there does come a point when they have to think the risk is worth it. Those Homestead Steel guys decided the risk was worth it. And some of them paid for that with their lives. So it's not an easy choice to make. It can be terrifying. But so at some point, somebody has to stand up and say, this isn't right. Okay, so I have a question. So if you're starting a union and the point of your union is to benefit and change the conditions that you're in and the labor laws, but then eventually your union fails, how do you find the support to regain that union so that way you can have it benefit the, f the future of like your generations because it's failing the current generation? People have to feel that there's something that the, from which they'll benefit. And it may take time to recreate that notion because people get pretty demoralized when something gets crushed like that. But there were a lot of attempts throughout the 1800s and early turn of the century of people attempting to form organizations because they didn't like the way they were being treated. They didn't like the fact that they were being not paid fairly or adequately or that their working conditions were intolerable. And as I said, a lot of people wound up getting killed for the benefits that we have right now. They wound up dead, and here we sit, the beneficiaries of that noble sacrifice. So it might take time to restart that, here's why it's in your best interest, but we have to make a case. And I would also say that um, just because um, you have a union um, doesn't necessarily mean that you can be complacent about having one because it seems that unions are really as strong as the, the people who are in them and who, um, who, who are willing to stand up for things and who are um, helping to ensure their, their continuity. And, and it's, it's an ongoing thing. A, a union is a, a dynamic thing that um, you can't just like let it rest on its laurels because um, it's, it's not going to... Um, do justice um, on its own. It, it's the people who are involved, and so it's um, it's always about um, being willing to um, you know to, to take little risks um, when when you can, and um, to be to be the vibrancy in that that you hope to to see, um, and and to be be courageous. Um, you might feel afraid, but Courage is acting in the face of fear, not in the absence of it. I see your hand. We have a question here, then I'm going to go over there. So my dad works at GM, and he had a very long process before he went on strike. How many days does that last, like the period of time where they choose what they're going on strike for or how they deal with it? How long does it usually last? I can't answer that question. I would imagine it has to do with the, what the, how the union functions and how it governs itself and what its membership is willing to deal with in terms of being out of work or being you know, off from the plant. But I don't know that there's a set time. Um, so my dad, he's been working for a company for 30 years and his shoulder has like slowly been deteriorating over time because of work. Like he works six days a week there for the last 30 years. Like obviously it's from work. 
but his company doesn't want to admit that, so they won't give him workers comp to get surgery, so he has to keep on working overtime and overtime and ruining his shoulder. But he's in a union, so how does he, and he's not the only worker there who's injured like that, so how does he get the union together to like, go on strike about that? He has to take that to the leadership of his union and tell them, look, this is, and, and obviously there's more than one person. That needs to become an, an issue for the union to go after a company that's abusing its workforce. So they have to make them aware, their leadership aware, and hope that they, and not hope, but insist that they take up that fight because that's what they're there to do. Okay, we have one more thing. Someone asked earlier about managers um, going out, like if they could go out with people who were doing informational picketing. And um, so I'm Virginia Ganeli. I'm an English professor here, and I'm a union member as well. And I've the unfor I'm also fortunately the recipient of a lot of institutional history from a lot of people who have um, you know, bestowed that upon me over the years that I've been here. And um, Deborah, I remember you telling me that when there was informational picketing here at St. Charles Community College from the union that some of the administrators came out and passed out drinks and, su and supported people during that time. Was it you that told me that or was it someone else? I, I was here when we did informational picketing and the union members, I was a new, I was new to the union because I had just been hired full time, not for very long. And I was not on continuing contract at that moment. So the fear was that there would be retaliation and that I might possibly be fired for any given reason, but the reason being you were on the picket line. So my contribution was to uh, we brought coolers onto campus and we passed out uh, sodas to students and water to, it was warm that time of year. So I could participate in that respect, but the union was trying to protect its more vulnerable members who did not yet have commit continuing contract. Okay, we have just a could we have about five or six more minutes if you have any other questions to, and here's one here. Is the union dependent on state? Like is it a state by state basis or whatever? Some states uh, have right to work and it doesn't mean that they don't have unions, but it's much harder to organize in those states. So as I said, Missouri rejected that, uh, but it, it Union membership is something that you choose in terms of, you know, nobody's going to force you necessarily, but it's in your best interest to be in a union, if at all possible. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but it's dependent on state law. And when states decide that they're going to have right to work, it doesn't mean you can't have a union, it just makes it more difficult. I see you in the front. We have a question back here, then I'll be up there. So what are some steps that we can stay active within a union, basically? Um, I would say, um, well, first of all, uh, join a union. Um, and if, if there's one that's not um, readily available to join, you know, f first of all, um, organize it if, if you need to. Um, and then, then join it. And then um, th there's a whole process involved in, in union building, um, getting, um, getting a vote to, um, uh, to uh, certify the union. And then um, it's, it's an ongoing thing to um, bring new people in. And so like, um, so talking about it on a regular basis with, um, in as much as you can, depending on uh, work regulations that you have. Um, and then uh, like having, um, making sure you have regular meetings and, um, and then, oh, um, what I keep running into, what I keep finding is, is that unions are, are so dependent on the people 
in them. Um, the people who are in them matter, and um, and so it's really important to um, to be as as involved as you can, and um, to to talk to people about it as as much as you can. Do you have any? That's a good question, um, and I would agree with what Rebecca's just said. Uh, participate, step up to positions of leadership. It might be scary, it might be uh, troublesome in terms of your schedule, but it's still worthwhile doing, because you benefit from it and so do your fellow union members. They benefit from it as well. I, as I said, I've belonged to a union from the moment that I became a full-time person. My contract, uh, my memorandum of understanding is negotiated by my union. My check comes to me because of that union. Uh, union dues, I pay with them with pleasure and with pride because I've got people who've got my back and they're going to be there to defend me and they're going to be there to improve my quality of life. So it does seem hard to make that sell sometimes, but participation, the activity of what you do within that union, going to the meetings, paying the dues, taking up positions of leadership, encouraging others, supporting those who do take up those positions is invaluable to the life of a union. Do we have time for one more question? Does anyone have one more question? Okie dokie. So there are stigmas against unions, obviously across the country, but would you say there's a greater stigma against healthcare workers like nurses unionizing because they're willing to strike and walk out of hospitals for the safety of their patients and for their own safety? Or do you think it is the same stigma that other union members face? I think nurses have a particularly difficult um, line to walk in that regard because I think you're right about how people perceive them. You're supposed to be <laughs> caregivers. You're supposed to be taking care of my loved ones and you're just going to walk out the door. Well, you know what? You have the same right as anybody else to a decent wage and a decent working environment and that a person happens to be a nurse does not take those things away. It does not mean you're not worthy of those things. You should have those just like anybody else has those. Just because somebody's making a product on the line, you get the same, you should have the same respect afforded to you, the same value to what you do, especially to what you do, because people's lives depend on it. It's like, well, if you think that's important, then obviously we should have better pay and better working conditions. So there may be a different stigma attached to it as opposed to union membership in general, but I don't think that negates the idea that you should have one and should do what you need to do to make things better for your profession. Okay, so I'd like to thank Deb and Rebecca for the information. And, and I'd also like to thank those in culinary for bringing their students to learn and to engage. So thank you for your questions. Democracy Day continues, Democracy Days continu continues tomorrow for our last day. We hope to see you there and thank you again for participating. Have a grand afternoon. You too, thank you.